Universal Design Education. And uh, I'm going to weave in an Australian poem because I'm feeling a tad bit poetic because what I'm going to show you actually needs some poetry to help um, soften the blow. <laughs> As background, uh, when I started at ANU, Julie told me how big her budget was for disability support. And I realised that we probably spend more on photocopiers in the university per year than we do on disability support. You, I don't have to tell you that the federal support we get for disability in universities is not great. And as we accept more and more students joyfully with disabilities. The dollars split into cents, and the cents split into half cents, and the disability team work harder and harder to make it work. But they do that because they believe that education is the thing that most makes the difference. I thought, well, if Julie doesn't have the budget, I could do something big to make a change. Uh, for universal design. Universal design is about making a learning environment in which everyone is welcome. And so I've taken Julie's little budget and I'm now gifting a big budget on a big project which we hope will transform our campus. So here is the backdrop and here is the poem. I've come to the end of so many old things. I've come to the end of the world. To wait for this mountain to flash, flash like a cloud struggling with light. I've come to the end of the world because the most important question we need to ask is education enabling or disabling? is something that I don't think all of us have asked as deeply as we can. If I go back, what do all of these have in common? If you ask the student, they will tell you that they're all empty. Hmm? If you ask everyone here, what will you say? They're scared. They're scared. Welcome to the world of higher education, where every learning space seems to be a step space. How long has higher education been a step space? Since the 12th century. We have built spaces with steps where one person has talked to many people and those many people we know are actually not many people. They are some people. And these brand new lecture theatres, which are empty, because I know we put counters on our lecture theatres, and we know students don't go into them after week three of semester. <laughs> we know that now. We didn't know that two years ago. We know that now. These beautiful spaces with comfortable chairs empty out every semester. If you are the one wheelchair user, where are you? Down the front. Right down the front. Staring the lecturer right in the eyes. Never allowed to not turn up. Always having to answer the questions and perhaps at risk of being tripped over by, by the lecturer. Higher education is a stepped place, and it has been so for 600 years plus. <coughs> the point about all of this is it's not just a, not a friendly place for wheelchair users or students with low sight ability, students who have hearing problems who need to get relay to hear what's going on. Able-bodied students don't use them either. This is not universal design. This is not a case of inequality. This is where inequality is inefficiency. And so, for somebody like me, we need to think about how we redesign, not just for equality, but realise that by doing that, we make a more efficient university. This question 
has been the most important question of ANU in embarking upon a very large project that I'm about to tell you about. Here's a picture of some of our learning spaces. If you like the colour beige, you will love these learning spaces. Okay? Any time you want to see beige in steps, you come and have a look. It's very beautiful. 1985 beige. Very, very beautiful. Okay? Here's the text. 1st of June next year, this building will close. We will close it. We will demolish it. Here's the scary bit. <laughs> Are you still with me? <laughs> I could correct here and say eighty percent of our enrollment is associated with this building. But after week three, less than ten percent of our enrollment. So these stepped beige spaces, which do not include or make feel welcome students with disabilities, are also not a great learning space for our students. It's very painful to ask ourselves, would we confront a moment like this? And generally, yes, I do speak my mind. That's probably the boldest slide that higher education has ever been associated with. I apologise if you are now very upset and traumatised because that is what I am dealing with at our university right now. Why are we dealing with this? Because this is not a problem of people. Right? If you put a counter on a lecture theatre, what you do is you start counting participation. What you do not do is point out an individual lecturer and tell them that it is their fault. Because what they are doing is doing what we have always done. For 600, 800 years, they have stood up in front of a group of people and they have talked. Their job is called lecturer. Their title is the learning style. And somewhere, the learning style got broken. The internet got invented, much to the regret of some of our staff. Lecture recording got invented, much to the regret of some of our staff. RFID chips, little computer chips, which can track student movement, did get invented, and some of our staff would really like to use those chips, and I've said no. <laughs> Something changed. You know that a student, if they do go to a lecture, can sit up the back and Google and fact check the lecturer and correct them. They can have their phone or two phones and their laptop so they can be listening with part of an ear and talking to their friend in the chair next to them and going on Facebook and doing the online quiz. They are young. They can do these things. It is magic. It is absolute magic. Okay? So we have used data to show that we should demolish these spaces. It feels brave, and I hope more will make this decision too. The data that we've used is not only the thermal counters, the counters in the lecture theatres. We started looking at the wireless signal usage by students and tried to identify when they are at their peak moment during the day. Does anybody want to guess when the students are most active? 12 a.m., whoever said that is right. 12 a.m. to 2 a.m. is when they are most active. So when staff have said to me, I would like the students to come to class, I have said, if you teach between 12 a.m. <laughs> and 2 a.m., you will have the most inclusive educational design that we can offer. If you do not, they will watch Netflix. That is what they will do, okay? So we are confronting data that is telling us that our design is not universal. So Julie's little budget, which gives her tiny access to equipment, is something that I can now come in and say, Julie shouldn't have to fix a campus where you need a high-powered wheelchair to get up the ramp to go to counselling. 
And in fact, my deputy broke the door to the counselling service in his wheelchair because he had got up such a speed going up the ramp. <laughs> we travelled by wheelchair to get there that he broke the door. And there is now a beautiful door, which is great. That took a couple of years to get fixed. But it's very bad that Julie has to beg around the edges of education and she should not have to. It is my responsibility to design a space where a student with visit, um, visual disability, hearing disability, physical disability, mental health challenges feels welcome. And any architect who tells me that a building suspended in the sky where the disabled student can go around the back entrance is not working for me. That is not design. <clears throat> so we made our decision. We stand by our decision. I'll go forward instead of backwards with my things here. And I ask the question, in doing this, have we come to the end or the beginning? What does it mean the end of? I've given you some ideas. One to many, constrained seating, Transition support to large classes. Think of all the work you do for students who require support for social adjustment to actually learn how to sit in a space that's empty after week three. The processing of content via intermediaries. And I'm very grateful I have that today. What is it the beginning of? One to many live disappears and the proportion changes. I can access the information myself. I am empowered as a student to learn for myself. I can't assume that the students are listening to the lectures in order. Most of them are downloading them in week 13 in one go. And so I have said to the staff, if you knew that, would you design your teaching differently? If they're binge listening, would you make the lecture shorter? Would you design it differently? Could you make it accessible for those students? And then two final terms I'm going to talk about, disaggregation and disintermediation. I'll just slow for you to sign. <laughs> yeah, no worries. <laughs> These two words basically mean breaking things apart and taking out the middleman. And that has been, I think, the essence of what I call the rise of universal education. Disaggregation is where students get to exert the right to break things down into the size, the speed and the availability that they want. If they don't like my lecture, they can go to the Khan Academy and they can listen. And Khan can talk in three minutes and he will often explain in three minutes what takes me 55 minutes. They can access that any time. 500 million students have accessed the Khan Academy. I work with edX. We have at any one time three million learners online who do self-paced learning. They choose what to listen to, when to listen to it, what questions to answer. They have broken degrees down into pieces that they choose to help them succeed as learners. I wish it was as accessible as it could be because I know from edX that this all presumes great access to the internet, great digital bandwidth, which this country does not have. So if we were to make this a universal design country, we would address our digital infrastructure to address one of the greatest inequalities in education that we have. We have also broken down education into badges to help students to acquire learning just in time, at the speed they want, and this is rising. More and more students are doing this. Okay? These all point to changes in learning. And we could let the technology drive the story, but it should not. What should drive the story is this point here. We should not be defined by our empty classrooms. An empty classroom is one that excludes. We need to be defined by places where students will come and learn. I do not want us to be defined by who we do not reach. So if I think about universal design education, 
Think about how radical that is. It means every space on campus is accessible to everyone. It means that the curriculum can be broken down and accessed by students, often in a sequence that makes sense to them but makes no sense to us. That they can access at the time of day that they wish and that we are there as their guide and their support to support that learning. When we reorient ourselves in that way, then I think we will have broken the greatest challenge and what I call the 800-year curse of building rooms that exclude. Thank you. Marnie, thank you so much. Um, do we have some questions in the room for, for Marnie? Uh, put your hand up and we'll get a microphone to you. Yep, down here. Um, I've been noticing a trend in many educational institutions, tertiary education institutions, towards um, increasingly impersonal teaching styles where um, there is no interaction with students face to face anymore. Um, and while I do understand that there is a design problem that could potentially be solved by moving everything online, there is a plethora of studies in education and educational psychology which recommend that face-to-face -face learning is still, in fact, the most efficient and effective way of teaching students. How does removing classrooms achieve efficient and effective teaching? It's a mistake to think that large lectures are efficient. Any large class is not efficient because education is about relationships. If you want to find the learning, you find the tutorials, the seminars, the field work, all the places where students still go. So my university belongs to edX and we have had close to 400,000 students study with us. We stand by that decision because there are students in the Middle East, in Africa, uh, in India, who are studying now with us that could not before. So we have made ourselves available to those students. At the same time, we are trying to move ourselves to focus on what a friend of mine from MIT called the magic. Let's remove the mundane and highlight the magic. All those small classes, field work, which we all run at universities, we just have lectures sitting on top of them. If we took the bit off the top, we would hit the part that's most valuable to students. The statistic I least like is one from about four years ago from Melbourne Uni, the first year in higher education um, survey, in which 51% of first year students said, I don't think my teacher knows my name. That is education by exclusion. So we have to stop thinking that some things are efficient. They're actually not efficient because the learning is not happening there and we have to redesign for inclusion, and that means focusing on the smaller class teaching. Mani, um, we've heard a lot during the last day and a half of this conference about how sometimes it can be the staff themselves who are in the way of fully flexible, accessible education. I'm very curious how you are bringing the staff along with something that many of them would find profoundly challenging. Yep. Uh, I think we are the biggest example of a Kubler-Ross grief spectrum. <laughs> Um, and I say that no what, what number are they all up to? <laughs> Some are on number one. Um, uh, look, with respect, the part that we focused on is, is making the education fun for students. So we have a lot of talk around inclusion for students. The empty lecture theatre is devastating for a staff member. It's terrible. You turn up and people do not come. It's actually personally hurtful. So our focus has actually been on the staff and how horrible this must be for them. So instead of only talking about students, we have focused in on what would make this more enjoyable for them. So yes, we do have some staff that are, some who do not believe the building will be demolished, and others who are saying to me, whoopee, it's about time we did this. And very many in the middle who just want a timetable sorted out, they want some certainty, they want to know what the gap in the demolition will be before we get new buildings and all of this, they want some certainty because this change is so big. To navigate this as one individual when your whole career you've done one thing. 
please never underestimate how hard that is. So I have huge respect for the staff and my job, as you said before, my job is to front up and to be with these staff. So I have been meeting with all the conveners of large courses and I will continue to do so for the next 18 months and on as we demolish and we rebuild because I owe it to them to be with them as we change and we go on this journey. Do we have any other questions in the room yet? Just here? We'll have two more. So we'll go to you here and then you over there. Thanks. Um, so I kind of disagree profoundly with your statement on your PowerPoint slide. I think accessibility is about thinking about people who aren't in the room and why they're not there, which I think, yeah, anyway. Um, so I guess... Your vision is very much based on kind of decentralization and kind of providing a lot of opportunities for customization of different people with different needs, choosing what works best for them. And I feel like, what, what are your thoughts, I guess, on this kind of illusion of choice? And um, does that lead to institutions kind of taking less responsibility and providing support to the most needy? Um, yeah. So I don't, I don't subscribe to the illusion of choice because I know that higher education is, travels with fault lines of inequality. And that starts at admissions, it starts in high school, it starts in pri primary school. The die is already set for so many people in so many ways. So making more of it available does not solve the problem. What we want to do is to, to refocus people's energy away from talking to empty rooms to actually engaging and thinking differently about who it is they are confronting and building a relationship with those students. Um, we are a residential university. We believe that's very important for us. We actually know that when students graduate, they often remember more the friends they made in the Hall of Residence than they do the content of the lectures. So from our point of view, the co-curriculum and the focus on building those relationships is absolutely critical. You need to because that young person cannot be assumed to have all the, all the cultural capital all the skills, all the experience, all the wealth to make navigating that space seamless and easy. So I don't take any of that for granted and I don't believe that a, um, a smorgasbord is what we're offering. I actually think we're refocusing our energy to focus more on care. Last question over here. No, you who've got the microphone. <laughs> <laughs> So I think throughout this conference, we've heard a lot about the value of um, awareness training and good attitudes to enabling universal design. How does the ANU's commitment to universal design in education square with the fact that we haven't had a campus accessibility audit in 14 years, we don't have a disability mm -hmm. action plan and haven't for four years, yep. uh, and we also have no disability awareness training, even when it was offered four yep. years ago? I'm very happy to answer that. So the first thing I'm doing is putting $260 million into starting to fix the problem around the accessibility of the campus. So that's stage one, and I will do that. And the disability action plan is part of the new strategic plan for the university. So the plan is going to the council on Friday, and then there will be a university experience plan, which my deputy's doing. Disability is part of that. So I apologise that we have a new vice chancellor. Uh, he's had to come up to speed and work on this, but of course, absolutely, and it's my commitment because uh, I come from a background where I understand that, that disability can present such an obstacle for participation in higher education. I don't want to see that happen. So I'm going to remove the ramps. Um, the reason why this build is so traumatic is that we are having to flatten seven buildings to actually flatten the ground to take away all the steps, to take away all the ramps, to actually make the space accessible for the very first time. And that's increasing the trauma on all the staff, but I will do that. So if you can count that as, as a, my down payment on disability inclusion, then please do. Marnie, many thanks indeed. Please thank Marnie Hughes-Warrington.